All righty, well, let's open our Bibles. Amen. John chapter 8, verse number 58. John chapter 8, verse number 58. In Sunday school, we've been learning about characters from the New Testament. We're getting ready to wrap up the study and uh, move on to something different. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to talk about a few people. We've, we've discussed a few that are not as well known, not as common in the New Testament, not everybody that's known to everybody. And then uh, last week, we talked about, uh, taught about the devil in the New Testament and where he's mentioned and, and what about him and what's going to happen to him. Amen. Old uh, smutty face going to get cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Praise God. Amen. And, but now, uh, this week, we're learning a little more about some major characters. We're going to learn a little bit about Jesus in the New Testament and what he says about himself. I love this study. Uh, and this is a great study, but we're going to learn about Jesus this morning. And, of course, we know Jesus is the Son of God. He's God himself. He's been around since time began. Hey, Jesus is not confined to just the New Testament. We know that. Jesus is in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, uh, and he's been around since time will began and, and until time will end. Amen. And I'll show you something about that. Revelations chapter 1, verse number 8. Let me, let me turn there real quick before we read that verse. Revelations 1, 8, just to show you, give you a verse there to, to use. Jesus says here, Revelations 1, 8 says, I can get it, there we go. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. So that's a good verse there. What a blessing. Jesus, He is, amen, that's the present. He was, that's the past, and He is to come, amen. Jesus is coming back, amen. And so He, uh, and so Jesus is eternal. And so, but we're going to see a little bit of what He says about Himself in the New Testament. Obviously, there is, the, the Bible is about Jesus, amen. So there's so much we could go through. But we're going to use, uh, stay in the book of John and just kind of use, Jesus says here, John 8, 58, it says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. In the book of John, you'll find this statement by Jesus, I am, more than any other book of the Bible. This comes as a reference. Jesus said this to the Jews specifically. He said, I am, specifically, because in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 14, and we're not going to stay in the Old Testament, uh, but Exodus 3.14, it says, And God said unto Moses, this is Moses talking to the burning bush, and Moses said, If I, if I talk to the people, what will I tell them? He said, what do I, Who do I tell them sent me? And he, God says unto Moses, I am that I am. That was the name that God told Moses to give to the children of Israel if they say, well, Mo, well if Moses, because Moses was going to come and he was going to say, look, God sent me to deliver you. I'm your deliverer. And so Moses said, well, but Lord, what if they, uh, what if they maybe don't hear me? And he said, what, who do I tell them sent me? And God said, you tell them, I am that I am hath sent you. The I am hath sent you. And so we come forward to John 8:58. And Jesus is talking to the Jews, and the Jews said here in verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And so you see, Jesus is using that reference to let them know, I am the one that spoke to Moses. And see, the Jews knew, the Pharisees, they knew the Old Testament. They knew the, the Genesis to Deuteronomy, those five books is called the Torah. They knew that. They memorized the Torah from back to, from back to front, almost. I mean, they knew it. So when Jesus said, I am, they knew what he was trying to reference and how that he was saying, I've been there. I've, I was there. And so Jesus is proving again his eternal existence in the New Testament. But we're going to stay in the book of John. And Jesus uses this reference when he says, I am, and he describes himself to us in the book of John, and that's what we're going to stay with. John chapter 6, verse number 48 is the first reference that Jesus gives us. John chapter 6, verse number 48 is the first time Jesus uh, says, I am, about himself. And 40, verse 48, sorry, he says, I am that bread of life. And so the first thing that Jesus tells us about himself, he says, I am that bread of life. Uh, let's back up there to verse 44 and just see. Uh, no, it says, No man come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. 
He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which, will, which I will give for the life of the world. Amen. What a, what a blessing. Jesus is the bread of life. This is referring to about salvation. He said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I love this comparison, how that Jesus compares the manna in the wilderness that the Jews ate was not... Uh, he said they would eat that and then they would die, but Jesus is the living bread. In today's society, a lot of people say, well, there's another way to heaven. And Jesus compares that to the manna that the Jews ate. It, it, you're gonna, it, you can eat that and think, well, this will get me to heaven, but that will cause you to die. Jesus is the only living bread, amen. He's the only one you can go through for salvation. The Jews ate the manna that God sent them, but that was a physical manna. Jesus is a spiritual bread, not a physical bread. Uh, the, the physical bread the, the Jews ate, that manna, it, it nourished them for a while, but then uh, it, but they still died. Jesus is a spiritual bread that if we partake of him, we can live for eternity. So a lot of people eat manna today in the sense of they're eating the manna of their works and they're eating the manna of, they're eating the bread of, of, what, of their church membership and their baptism and all of those things and it's getting them by, but one day they're going to die from that and spend eternity in hell. Only Jesus is the living bread that will give you eternal life. Uh, also, this is a reference how that Jesus is a spiritual bread. There are a lot of uh, religions that say you can take a, uh, a bread and it become Jesus and all, of this, uh, and all of this stuff, and that's not true. Jesus says, I'm the living bread, but he's talking about a spiritual bread, not a physical bread. We're, when we take the Lord's Supper like we get to tonight, amen, May the 1st, I'm excited about that. We'll get to take the Lord's Supper tonight as a church. When we take that, it's not the literal body of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. The bread is a picture of that Jesus, the living bread, and it reminds us of Jesus. Some try to teach that this bread becomes Jesus after you take it and all of this stuff, and they try to use this verse to say, well, you have to partake of that to get Jesus. And Jesus said, that's not it. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The, 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 the focus is on whether you believe. And so Jesus gives us this illustration how that, he is sal how that he is the only way to heaven and salvation is through him and not through either your works or some like, the, like some teach through that bread or that wafer, amen, uh, and, and things like that. We're going to move on. John chapter 8, verse number 12. John chapter 8, verse number 12. What else Jesus says about himself? He says here, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. So Jesus compares himself. He's the bread of life. And here, he's the light of the world. Amen. He's the one that the world dwells in darkness because of sin. And Jesus came to bring light. Amen. To show us the way. The Pharisees, in verse 13, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. So again, Jesus is showing them his eternal existence. He says, I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going. He's like, you haven't got a clue. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the one that will bring salvation. But I'm also the one that after you're saved, you can walk in me. He says, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. You can walk after Christ and not dwell in darkness. You don't have to wander around the, this planet thinking, where am I going to go? What do I do? Why am I here? What's my existence? Jesus is that light that we can walk after and shed light on our lives. Amen. For, uh, and, and for where we, where we are to go. Amen. He's the light of the world. But we also are the light. I was going to show you something. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world, but then we're going to turn over to uh, John 9, 5. John chapter 9, verse 5. This is a neat verse. The Bible says, as long, Jesus says, uh, we'll start in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world... 
I am the light of the world. Remember how in the, in the New Testament, we won't go there, Jesus, he commands us that, he, or he tells us, you're the salt of the earth, and then he says, you're the light of the world. We are God's light because Jesus physically is no longer in this world. Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He died, gave his life on the cross, shed his blood, rose three days later. Now he's in heaven. Jesus is no longer physically in this world. Now he is spiritually, his presence, the Bible says he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, he's with us also on the inside as a believer. But physically he's no longer in this world. So we now are his light to the world. You now are God's light. Jesus commanded us, he said, ye are the light of the world. While Jesus was here, he was that light that people could go to, get direction. He instructed the disciples after he left. Now we become his light, but it's Jesus really being the light through us. You are, because you have Christ on the inside, you are now his representative. His light is to shine through us. That's what makes the difference. If we try to be a light in and of ourselves, it won't work. But if we yield to the Holy Spirit of God to help us be a light to this world, then God allows His light to shine, and that's what makes a difference. That's what will draw people. People will see you and say, there's something different. Not because you're anything special, but because you allow Jesus to shine through you. Notice how Jesus compares, though. He says, I must work the works of Him that sent me. Jesus was a light, but what was a light was His works. His light, but what he did, amen, his death on the cross, his healing people, all of those things drew people, showed, Jesus, showed the world who he was. A lot of people say, well, I can be a light but never do anything for God. And that's not true. Jesus was a light and he did the works of him. It says, I must work the works of him that sent me. So if you don't do what Jesus asks, you're not being a light. Because Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. One day, Jesus is coming back. That's the night time. You, we won't have a chance to be a light. There will be no more chance. This world will be gone. The Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of this world. The saints will be raptured up. And no longer will there be a light in the world. So we have to work while it is day. It's comparable to the story of how that, uh, uh, Jesus talks about the sower sowing the seed and all of those things. You have to work in the daytime. When it's nighttime, you can't work. When comes the night, that's when you rest. And one day there will be a night for us. There will be a day of rest. Thank the Lord. Amen. We'll be in heaven and no longer, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. We'll be able to rest. However, in your rest, you'll remember what you did during the day. And if you did the works of Him that sent you, then you'll be proud. Well, not proud is a prideful sense, but proud is in you'll be thankful. Man, I did what God asked. But if you were unprofitable, if you weren't the light that you should have been, then you'll remember that for eternity. God says you'll remember because God is going to reward us for our works. Amen. As a Christian. Not saying that if you didn't do anything for God, you get to die and go to hell. That's not true. Men, salvation's free. Heaven's free. But what you do for the Lord on this earth, God rewards. Amen. And God will give us uh, the fruit of our labor, and you'll remember that. So we're to be a light. Amen. That's why Jesus says, don't hide it under a bushel. Your light is able to be hid. You can hide that light. You have the light of the world in you, Jesus Christ, but you can do so much in yourself that can hide that light. We're to be a light in how we talk. We're to be a light in how we walk. We're to be a light in how we dress. We're to be a light in the music that we listen to. All of those things should point to Jesus. A good way to put it is, when you do, to do the works of Him that sent you, everything that you do should point to the Lord Jesus Christ. If anything that you do, whether in music, whether in dress, whether in, uh, whether in going out, uh, anything that you do, if it draws attention to you, you can know that you're not being the light that you should. This world, the devil says, draw attention to yourself. Jesus says, draw attention to him. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So when you in your life do your job by lifting up Jesus Christ, you're allowing him to be a light. 
So that's why, I, and like in my home, I tell my wife, whatever we do, we try to draw attention to the Lord. In other words, here's a good statement for you. Let me find it. I wrote it down. You should not draw attention to yourself physically more than you draw attention to Jesus spiritually. The more physically people see of you, the less spiritually they see of Jesus. So the more in your music that's the more physical, the more attractive to the beat, the more attractive to the body, which music is dealt with. That's what, it's, that's what a lot of, some of you know, you've been in that before, where music is all about the body, all about yourself, all about me. When you sing these hymn books, it's hard to, it's hard to take pride. Because when you sing out of this and you think, here, uh, like this, I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Boy, it's hard to take pride in that, amen. I'm weak, but God's strong. You're giving God the glory. You're giving God attention. That's how our music should be. Why? To draw people to Jesus, to be a light. That's why at the church, all of our music is, is dealt with drawing people to Jesus. Now, a lot of churches will compromise and allow these rock bands and all this stuff to come into church. You know why? Because they can't gather a crowd because people aren't getting saved, people aren't changing, and people don't want that. So they use contemporary music and all this stuff to draw attention to the body, make people feel good, but it doesn't last. That's that manna we we're talking about. It lasts for a little bit, and then it dies, and then they, they're, they're not spiritually satisfied. So we have to, as a church... Stay committed to doing right, but stay committing to drawing people to the bread of life that will satisfy the light of the world. Amen. And again, not just our music. Amen. That's one area. Our dress, how we look and how we act in this present world will either draw people to Jesus or draw people to ourselves. That's why with my wife, whenever she walks out the door, I take a good look at her up and down because I want to make sure that nobody is drawn to her. I don't want somebody's eyes on her. I want them when they see her to see Jesus Christ. Same with me. I want somebody when they look at me to be drawn to the Lord. This world is all about looking at ourselves, forming our body out. Why? To take our minds off of Christ and put our minds on the body. That's the flesh. That's the devil at work. So be careful, because the more, like I said, the more you draw attention to yourself physically, the less people's minds are spiritually. That's why we're supposed to be a light. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, and God wants us to be a light, amen, because people need to be saved. Lives need to be changed, amen. People are out there, they're hungry for the gospel, but they'll not get it if we're not the light that we should be. Jesus said, don't hide it under a bushel. Don't take the light that God's given you, the precious light, and hide it and say, well, you know, I, I'm not... Now, now, people can be saved, sure, but not as much as could be as if you let your light shine. Boy, what a big responsibility we have, amen, to let our light shine. Uh, you know, it, it, we, we've been given that task by the Lord, amen, as a church to let the light shine. Amen. we got to keep moving. John chapter 10, verse 7. John chapter 10, verse 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Boy, what a, what a neat uh, illustration here the Lord gives us of himself. He's the door of the sheep. He is salvation. You have to go through him. No other way to heaven. All that's ever come before Jesus are thieves and robbers, he said. All these other religions that try to tell you there's another way besides Jesus are compared to a thief and a robber. They're trying to get what belongs to God. He says, but the sheep did not hear them. He says, I am the door. And then look, he says, you shall have life and have it more abundantly in verse 10. Amen. So Jesus wants to give you life, everlasting life, and he wants to give it to you more abundantly. In other words, not just in heaven one day, but Jesus, while you're on this earth, he says, if you go, you go in and out and find pasture. While you're on this earth, Jesus wants you to have 
life. Amen. Not live around like the world where they live in death. The world lives in death. They live in sin. Sin brings death into their lives and there's all these problems and all these heartaches and all the things that go on. But Jesus wants to give us life and He wants to have it more abundantly. He wants you to dwell and, and feed on green pastures, the Bible says. He wants us to go in and out and be able to find pasture through Him. But you can only do that through Jesus. You can find contentment through the door. You can find happiness. You can find joy. You can find peace. But if you go to anybody else, even as a sheep, because see here he says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So even as a sheep, even as a part of God's fold, if you leave for, for a time and go to somebody else to find something, you're still a sheep. Praise God for eternal security. Amen. You're still a sheep. You're still in the fold of God, but you won't find pasture. You won't be able to grow. You won't find the pasture that God has. The world says, well, it's greener on the other side, but when you get there and you try to get what the world has, you'll find there's nothing but a barren desert. People have been trying to feed on what the world wants to give them for years, and they're never satisfied because there's nothing. The world is empty. The world's vain. has nothing to offer, but God says, you'll find pasture with me. So even as a sheep, even as of the fold of God, we must be careful because we want to stay close to the Lord. Don't let the thieves and robbers come and make you think, well, we have something that you don't. Sometimes even churches do this where they try to say, well, we are a good church, and we, but we compromise here in little things, but it's okay. God says no. God's blessing's not on that. God's blessing's not on a church that doesn't stick by the book. Amen. Sometimes they tell you, well, you can find greener pastures in a different version. Watch out. That's a thief and a robber. Because they have changed God's word. And I'm going to bring a man in here soon. His name is, uh, uh, oh, wow, just slipped my mind, Miss Houston. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, man. He just came. But anyway, he does a big KJV Bible display and talks about how much that uh, the, uh, he's an evangelist and how much that they've taken out of the Bible and he shows you and compares you verses to verses and things. It's, it, is, it is neat. He has Bibles all the way back from William Tyndale all the way up till the last time. Who remembers when Walmart printed out their 500th anniversary of those little uh, Bibles and stuff? It was neat. I've got one in my office. They printed them out, sold them and stuff. But he's got... Everybody, I mean, from, I mean, and actual copies, they've been uh, put and sealed and all this. It is, it is a neat thing to see how God has preserved His Word. Because God promised you you'd have His Word because God wants you to find pasture. These other versions, they take so much out of the Bible, they leave you nothing to eat. And that's why you can't be satisfied. That's why we don't preach out of them. Because there's so much gone, all the nutrients are gone. Maybe there's a little bones here and there, but it's not blessed of God. Amen. That's why be careful. There are thieves and robbers out to steal you from the, from the, from the shepherd. What's well, the next thing? John 10, 11, we see the next thing. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Jesus gives us an illustration how he's also the shepherd. He protects the sheep. Jesus watches over the sheep. Jesus takes care of the sheep. He loves you. Jesus takes care of you, provides for your needs. He knows what the sheep needs. But then he shows us here how that there are wolves. These are the thieves and robbers we talked about. You notice there he said, The wolf cometh in and leaveth, or the hireling is somebody that is hired to watch the sheep, but he has no interest in the sheep. Okay, the good shepherd has interest in you. He loves you. And hireling is just somebody for hire but has no interest in the sheep. When the wolf comes, the hireling runs off because the sheep aren't his anyway. He's just hired to watch them, but he's not going to sacrifice his life for the sheep. But Jesus, he says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus loved you so much, he gave his life for you. Amen. To prove that he's not an hireling. Amen. He didn't have just a, a, a monetary interest in us. Amen. He loved us. But a hireling will have that. And sometimes some pastors can be this way. We can be, pastors can be more of a hireling where there's no interest in the flock of God. There's no interest in the welfare of God's people and how they grow. They're just in it for money. And so when the wolf comes, 
You never see him again. When sometimes maybe something happens, now not every pastor, amen. I know, uh, you know, uh, I know a pastor uh, up in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, he, uh, he, well, he was. Now he's in uh, uh, New Mexico. But he was at a church there in Denver, and and he was trying, and the Lord, and the Lord blessed. They saw souls saved, but just, just, just problems came, you know. And it wasn't his fault. It, it just problems came, and the Lord led him just to resign and go to another church. Now another pastor is there taking over the church and doing a great job. It's not that one man wasn't blessed of God, another man is. It's that God has you where he wants you for a time and a season. But you'll know a hireling by when problems come, when the wolf comes, and instead of sticking it out and fighting it out, they just run and flee. Amen. I know I got to talk to Pastor Holman uh, this last week, and, and I love talking to Pastor Holman. He's a funny guy. He was driving a bus for juniors, he said. He's like, I got a bunch of juniors on my bus, he said, so if you hear a bunch of noise. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he didn't start driving because, you know, school bus, you can't drive and talk at the same time. So. But uh, just so you know, he wasn't oh, breaking the law there. So. But he was talking to me, and he was just talking to me about the church. And he said when he first took the church, how that, he said, there's only one person still here from when he first took the church. He said, the rest of them split, came in, left. He had problems. He said, he said, brother, you encouraged me. He said, listen, he said, as a pastor, he said, you'll never know. You just get up there and love, love God's word, love God's people. Amen. And uh, he talked about and, and reminded me how that he stuck it out. Amen. Now the Lord moved him. God had his will, will and his way in his life. Uh, but he was here for a long time, and he told me how that there was problems that people tried to cause and all of those things. Amen. That's not a hireling. Amen. That's a shepherd. Amen. We're the under-shepherd is what a pastor is. But anyway, Jesus is the good shepherd. Enough of rabbit trails, as Brother West said. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, Jesus is the good shepherd. Amen. Now, John eleven twenty five. 25. John eleven twenty five. 25. Have another verse here real quick. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? What a blessing. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. One day Jesus is coming back and he is our resurrection. He resurrected, number one, himself. Amen. Jesus conquered death himself to prove that he could conquer death for us. But when Jesus comes, he's our resurrection. The only reason we can have a resurrection, the only reason we'll get to spend eternity in heaven is because Jesus is our resurrection. If somebody relies in something else than Jesus, they will not have a resurrection. Simply put, if you rely in a church, you'll not have a resurrection. If you rely in baptism, you'll not have a resurrection. If you rely in anything else, funny how that all these things point to how Jesus is for eternal life. Jesus is the only way. But then he shows us another thing. He says, and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So we have a contrast. We have he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, I die to the flesh to live for God. So Jesus said, if you believe in him, though you're dead, to yourself physically in this world, you, you die to the lust of the flesh, yet you live unto Christ. Because when you live to the flesh, ultimately it brings death. But when you live to God, it brings life. Amen. There's something that lives in what Jesus does. The church is alive. Amen. The church is alive because of Jesus. What we do, even though we're dead to ourselves, we don't want to bring attention to ourselves, but yet because we serve for God, we have a life. We're alive. That's why you have dead churches, because they're not bringing glory to Christ, they're bringing glory to themselves. So what that happens is, is they die, not in a physical sense, but they die, but there's no life in it. Because Jesus is that life. And then we have, see, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now, is that saying that that doesn't mean we'll have your funeral? No. Saying you'll get to live for eternity. There are two deaths in the Bible. You have your physical death, and then in Revelation chapter 20, there's the second death. That's hell. Amen. Jesus says, if you believe in me, you'll live for eternity. 
you'll have everlasting life. Amen? It's not saying that your physical body won't pass away. Some people misunderstand this and say, well, if you're really saved, maybe you live eternal. Maybe you're, you're immortal. <laughs> no, we know it's not true. Amen? Otherwise, we're all in trouble. <laughs> hey, no. But Jesus said it's not that. It's that you'll live for eternity. You'll have everlasting life. Hell is considered everlasting death. Yet you live for eternity, but that's not life. It's an everlasting death. Now, it never ends. It's a death that never ends. Your physical death is a time that has a beginning. When, you be, you, when you're born, you begin to die. The, moment, the, the day you're born, your body begins to die. And then the day you die is the end. That's the end of physical death. That's, that's the sting of death, the Bible calls it. The, the death has no sting for a Christian because once you're dead, you're still alive in heaven. Amen. You, you have everlasting life. But if you die without Christ, you have everlasting death. It's a death that has no end. It is not life. People say, well, you want to live eternally in heaven or live eternally in hell. It's not really that you live. You die eternally in hell is what it is. It's an eternal death, eternal damnation. And so that's the difference, amen. When you, you, it's not saying in me you shall never die physically, but you'll never die. In other words, you'll never have that everlasting death, amen. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about that. John 15, 5, amen. John 15, 5, the next thing. Uh, or, and this, uh, this is kind of all in one. Jesus come, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, John 14, 6. I apologize. This isn't the next thing. But John 14, 6 kind of sums that up. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's a good verse to use, how that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's all of it in one. Amen. And uh, there's no other way. And now John 15, 5 is the next I am. Jesus, uh, John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. So then Jesus compares himself when you're saved. He's the vine. He's where your nourishment comes from. You're the branch. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. The branch alone will wither and die. But when a branch is connected to the vine, life comes. So as a Christian, if you try to live this world of yourself, you're going to wither and die. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to lose heaven, but what it's saying is your spiritual life will just will be nothing. You won't have a, you're not spiritual because you're not connected to the vine. That's why people that say, well, I, I can have church at home. Your spirit, their spiritual life, that's why they don't know what they believe. Their spiritual life is just withered. Why? Because to be connected to the vine, you've got to be at God's house. To be connected to the vine, you've got to be in God's Word. To be connected to the vine, you spend time in prayer. All of those things connect you to the true vine. Amen. Notice how Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So if you're a branch, you're all branches this morning. There you go, new revelation for you. You're a branch. And uh, I'm trying to start to look like a branch <laughs> with this smoothie thing. I don't want to be the, walk up your little stick. My brother now is a branch. Let me tell you, Mitchell, I got to have him. Uh, Wes met him, but some of you haven't met my brother Mitchell. He's just a skinny twig, man. I tell you, he just want, and he's just done. And, uh, sorry. But, but we're all branches this morning. And if we abide in Jesus, if we abide in the vine, if we dwell with Jesus, then we'll have fruit. And when you have fruit, it says he beareth fruit, he purgeth it. In other words, he makes you better so you can bear more fruit. So when you as a Christian go through times of purging and you say, well, I don't know really what God's doing, just know that God's doing what's best because he wants you to bring more fruit. God has to make you look different when you purge. God has to make you act different when He purges you. All of those things is God purging you to bring more fruit. If you are a Christian that does not allow God to purge and you don't bring fruit, then eventually the Bible says He taketh you away. Not saying He takes salvation. Salvation is guaranteed for eternity. But in other words, you spiritually are of no use. Sad we could get to that point where we could spiritually be of no use to God. But God says there, are, there is a time when a Christian... Now, very rare that a Christian becomes absolutely of no use, but it happens. Where a Christian gets so hard in their heart to God, they don't care. They say, God, I don't care. And then God says, all right. And God removes that branch. Very sad. I've seen it happen. It's very sad. But you watch people's hearts get hard. They get hard at the church. They get hard at the pastor. They get hard at the Word of God. They just get hard. 
and eventually God removes them because now they're not helping. And uh, now, and the good thing is, you can be restored. Amen. If you do get right with the Lord, you can be restored. But it happens where God takes away the branches. Now, look there, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. You cannot bear fruit of yourself. If you're not abiding in Christ, there's nothing you can do to bring spiritual fruit. If we as a church don't abide in Christ and allow God to have His way, then there will be no spiritual fruit at this church. We have to abide in Christ. When I go sowing, I'm always praying and I ask God to help me and to use me and I yield myself to the Lord because I know I can't bring forth spiritual fruit. I got to go sowing this past week, Mick Markell, and, and, uh, and I got to go sowing on Thursday and then Friday it rained and rained me out and we couldn't go and do as much as we wanted to. But I got to three, see three people saved. Why? Because I, was, I told God, I said, I can't do it. God has to do that work. God has to bring people. Amen. I got to see Tony saved, a man with no legs. And uh, he was riding his uh, scooter down the thing. Mm, he's driving down, driving down the road. And uh, it was right before I stopped and met you, Markel. That's what it was. Tony, he was driving down the road. Mm, it was cool, man. That little thing was moving. I was like, I need one of those. I'd drive around the church. Mm. And, uh, and he was moving and he stopped and, he, and I got to give him the gospel. And then I met another man, Michael, yesterday. And I asked him, I said, you know, if you died, you'd go to heaven. He goes, no. I said, oh, would you like to? He goes, oh, yeah. So I took the Bible, showed it to him. I said, now, would you like to ask Jesus to come in your heart and save you? He goes, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. And uh, I was like, hey, amen, praise the Lord. And, uh, and he got saved yesterday. He's supposed to come to church uh, uh, hopefully next week, but, uh, but be in prayer for him. But, you know, but again, we can't bear fruit of ourselves. We have to abide in Christ. Keep moving on. I'm sorry. Verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. This is not an illustration. A lot of times, let me help you, a lot of pastors will tell you, if you don't work for God, you, you don't, you don't, you're not saved. And this is what they try to use and say, the branches that aren't abiding in Him, they're cast forth, they're withered, and they're burned, and they go to hell. Bunch of nonsense, okay? Baloney, malarkey, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't read their Bible, okay? The Bible not, is not talking about if you're saved and you don't abide in Christ, then you lose your salvation. If that's true, then throw the whole Bible away because God, because God lied to you. Okay? That's not how it works. Okay? If you go and you, and you leave the church and you don't do all this and I come to your house and visit you and you're like, Pastor, I'm sorry, I'm, not in, I, I'm the worst Christian ever, that doesn't mean I'm going to come to you. Well, you're going to hell. Come on. Come on. Jesus is better than that. Amen. When Jesus promised you eternal life, he meant it. Amen. And uh, nothing amount of what you do uh, it, uh, physically is going to take that away from you. John 10, 28 says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Amen. This is talking about how that when you're not uh, profitable for God, you become withered in your Christian life. And God, uh, uh, and I've seen where God has taken people and, and God's killed people. I remember one time a pastor, uh, my old pastor, Dr. Dean Miller, told a story of a man, and uh, we'll hurry and go uh, and be done. But a man that he was in his church and he just got away from God, got backslidden, and he watched him just his heart get hard, or his heart get hard, excuse me. And uh, he said he tried to go by, visit, just, just a hard man. He said, I don't want anything to do with God. He knew he was saved, but he said, I just, I, I'm done. And he said he watched out that not a week later, God killed him. It happens, amen. God will not mess around. When you're his child, God loves you, but God's not playing around. God's not playing favorites. Well, I'll give you a break, but not, God holds everybody the same accountability. We think sometimes that we get saved and we can just waltz around and go, la -da -da -da, hey, God, what's up, and live our own lives. God says, I'm not playing. God means business. Now, God's long-suffering. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's why we're here. God's long-suffering. But God has a point where he reaches a limit. And he says, once you've withered, then he casts you away. Men gather them into the fire, and they're burned. What a sad day. And that's also a reference to one day when God sets on fire your works. God will give you your works. And the Bible says if it's hay, wood, and stubble, it'll burn, be gone. But if it's gold, silver, and precious stones, it'll stay. One day God will cast your withered life before Him and burn it. What stays is what you keep. What leaves is what you didn't do for God. 
So sad, uh, a sad illustration there. Anyway, um, and that's the, that's the end of the I am's uh, that, that God gives us in, in, the word, uh, in the book of John. How, the rest of that is now going into Jesus' crucifixion and, and all of that. But those are the, the, the six I am's that Jesus gives to compare himself. If you want to know what it, who Jesus, uh, just, if you want to describe Jesus, you describe him in those six I am's. Jesus compared himself. The best illustration is what Jesus said of himself. I am. Amen. Best thing about it, Jesus is the I am for salvation. Amen. If you're not saved this morning, boy, this would be a good day to get saved. Trust Jesus as your Savior. If you're saved, born again, let's be compelled to abide in that vine. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the lesson we learned from the Word of God. Bless the morning service to follow. Lord, what a great morning that we have planned, Lord, and just all that's going to be done. Thank you, Lord, for the visitors being here, Markel, and thank you, Lord, for him being faithful and, and coming and being faithful to his Word. Bless the morning service, all that we do and say. We love you. We thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.